Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're here to talk about the manosphere and misogyny, sexual violence online, uh, with the rise of revenge pornography, threats of sexual violence. Sexual violence online is, is increasing rapidly, and I think law enforcement is very much uh, scrambling to catch up. But of course, we're also seeing social media and internet platforms being harnessed in incredibly powerful and innovative ways to empower survivors and create change. So we're here to talk about that kind of dichotomy. Um, obviously, by nature, this session will cover topics that might be difficult and upsetting, including sexual violence. Um, we might be talking in quite graphic terms um, about ways in which that's discussed online. So as ever, if anybody feels the need to step out, we won't be offended. If you want to go out and come back in, that's fine as well. There are um, trained therapists downstairs at the Survivors Trust stall if anyone feels that they'd like to talk to someone. And there are some helpline numbers in the program as well. Um, there is recording happening at the back, but it's just recording the panel and not the audience, just to let you know. And there will be lots of time at the end to ask questions to our brilliant panel. Um, I've been asked to gently remind people that that will be a Q&A session rather than op an opportunity for sharing personal testimony, but that there is a sharing session at 4.30 in the committee room. So I'm so pleased to be joined by this absolutely stellar panel. We're so lucky today. I'm going to introduce them to you. So to my left, directly, we have Naomi alexander Naidu. She's a movement builder at Shen, a global nonprofit supporting survivors of abuse across borders. Naomi is an experienced community builder for systems change who specializes in building networks and movements on social and environmental justice issues such as gender equality, climate justice, anti-racism, and transforming finance. She's an advisor to the Make My Money Matter campaign and Own It, a joint initiative of Friends of the Earth and Enroll Yourself, supporting women to take climate action with their personal finances. She's also an organizer with POC Impact, a community connecting, recognizing, and supporting people of color working in social impact. In 2020, Naomi was recognized as one of the leading BAME voices in the UK environmental movement by Climate Reframe and was highlighted as a standout star in Innovate Finance's Women in FinTech Power List. Next to her is Sophia smith Gaylor. You've very helpfully ranged yourselves in the order I have you. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, she's a multi-award winning reporter and author who has pioneered how TikTok can be used for journalism, bridging the gap between traditional media and Gen Z. For the BBC World Service, she uncovered the misuse of political ads during the US election, as well as Donald Trump's covert campaigning on the app. And now as a senior news reporter at Vice World News, she's reported on everything from the anti-vaxxers and incels gaming TikTok's algorithm to youth washing at COP26 and spiking in the UK. Her TikTok journalism has been shortlisted in the British Journalism Awards as Innovation of the Year, and her first book, Losing It, will be published by HarperCollins in April next year. Next to her, we have Julia Slupska, a doctoral student at the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity and the Oxford Internet Institute. Her research focuses on technologically mediated abuse like image-based sexual abuse or so-called revenge pornography and stalking, as well as emotion, care, and metaphors in cybersecurity. So please join me in welcoming this incredible panel. So at the beginning, I've been asked to give you a little bit of a kind of overview of what we're talking about when we talk about the manosphere. The word manosphere is in the title of this session, but that doesn't necessarily assume that everybody knows what it is. Um, I researched the so-called manosphere um, for two years for my book, Men Who Hate Women. And essentially, what we talk about when we're talking about the manosphere is a kind of loosely connected network of different communities and movements. And even the terminology that we use to describe them really is a red flag, because we talk about manosphere in the way that we talk about man flu or man cave. It's kind of slightly dismissive, slightly humorous. It minimizes, kind of in the same way that when we use the word troll to talk about online abusers, we're kind of dismissing them. We're sort of saying it's sticks or stones. It's not a big deal. We're saying that these are people who are hidden under bridges and they're not among us. And there's that real kind of lack of understanding of the severity of what we're talking about with the manosphere as well, of course, as with online abuse. So the different communities and groups within the manosphere are certainly interconnected, but they're also quite distinct in their own belief systems and in their activities. 
Perhaps the most extreme that you may have heard of are incels. Um, these are people, men specifically, who consider themselves involuntary celibates. In other words, they're men who aren't having sex and they'd like to be. But they explicitly blame women for that. They see women very much as dehumanized sex objects who owe sex to men. And they consider that women should be punished as a group for the fact that they aren't getting it. So these are men who talk regularly and um, very much across their forums about what they describe as a rebellion or a day of uprising when women should be massacred. They talk very openly about keeping women as sex slaves, about raping women. They debate whether rape should be decriminalized and argue that it shouldn't because that would take the enjoyment out of it for the rapist. These are not a tiny community of pitiable guys who don't have any friends and really are just deserving of our support and our sympathy. In the forums that I monitored for the book alone, they were very often in excess of 10,000 members. They have millions of posts. They're extremely active communities with thousands of people online at any moment that you visit. And of course, none of that takes into account people who are coming into contact with this information and this ideology without actively being members. And all over the world, men have gone offline explicitly in the name of incel ideology in the last 10 years and massacred people. So we've seen around 100 people murdered or seriously injured in the last 10 years alone in acts that, if they related to another specific demographic group, we would describe as terrorist acts, very simply. These are people who've been groomed and radicalized online into hatred of a specific group, in this particular case, women, and have acted on that hatred. So it's pretty straightforward in terms of most international definitions of terrorism. But that isn't what we see in terms of how we respond. And I think it's partly because of a, a Venn diagram of two blind spots, if you like. The normalization of violence against women, which we struggle to think of as something extreme or out of the ordinary. And our collective um, perception of terrorism and how very difficult we find it to apply that terminology to white men when they commit terrorist acts. So the fact that the vast majority of men in these groups are white, educated men aged between about 25 and 44, and the fact that their targets are women, combine to make this a particularly invisible form of terrorism. They're closely connected to other groups like men going their own way, who think that women are so toxic and dangerous and so likely to make false rape allegations that men should simply cut them out of their lives altogether, which again sounds extreme and like you must be talking about a handful of losers until you realize that in reality, for example, in a recent study, 27% of American men essentially now subscribe to that ideology insofar as they say they would not now have a one-to-one -one meeting with a woman in the workplace because it's too risky. So these are groups who might sound very extreme, but whose ideology has incredibly effectively been smuggled into the mainstream. And that isn't an accident. It's something that's happened very deliberately, in part through the deliberate gaming of algorithms and social media platforms. For example, they describe the use of memes and cultural touch points as adding cherry flavor to children's medicine. So they actively describe using those kinds of online jokes and banter to sneak young people in. And it's a very close and important relationship to mention between these extremist misogynistic groups and other online hate groups, particularly white supremacists and the far right, who again explicitly and deliberately see anti-feminism particularly as a kind of gateway drug. So they're very open about that. They say get them with the anti-feminism and then pull them further down the slope. Then there are groups who are kind of slightly more in the mainstream. They have a kind of veil of respectability, but they're still very much on a continuum. There's men's rights activists who claim to care about really important issues affecting men, like men's mental health, but actually devote their entire energy and resources to attacking and undermining feminism. So they're trying to defund frontline sexual violence services, for example, rather than putting any effort into actually dealing with issues like male mental health. And in fact, ironically, they very much double down on exactly the kind of outdated gender stereotypes that we know from research contribute to that poor mental health in the first place. So they very much encourage a worldview where men should be men and women should be women. Men should be at home looking after the children. And as you might gather from this particular description, these are also groups which are extremely homophobic, extremely transphobic. They're really exclusionary of anybody who doesn't fit into that completely heteronormative binary of how they see men and women. And they're furious with what they perceive to be women stepping outside of that hyper-submissive, hyper-sexualized role. 
um, pickup artists are the other group that kind of fit within this bracket of the manosphere. Um, and they might sound like a quite different group, but in reality, they're starting from a very similar starting point. If you think of these men seeing women as utterly dehumanized slot machines for sex, essentially, incels think that the slot machines are rigged and won't pay out no matter what they do. Um, and they're furious and basically want to kick them and destroy them as a result. Pickup artists believe that there is a secret combination of buttons that if you push will force the machine to play, pay, pay out every time no matter who it is press, pressing the buttons. Um, and so they train men in a billion dollar global industry where you can attend a boot camp in pretty much uh, any major city in the world pretty much any weekend and pay several thousand dollars or pounds to be taught how to essentially weaponize the sexual harassment and assault of women. And again, this is something that we minimize in our discussion of it in popular culture where pickup artistry is associated with the lovable rogue of Joey and Friends or Barney and How I Met Your Mother. But the reality is that this is hyper-racialized. It's something that specifically encourages the targeting, for example, of Asian women as submissive, the sexual assault of Asian women because they spread the message you can get away with it, particularly if you're a white man. Um, it's a community that is obsessed with specific issues like what they call overcoming LMR or last minute resistance. In other words, they're literally teaching often vulnerable young men that all women will say they don't want to have sex just before they have it, but it's actually just this thing called last minute resistance and you need tricks and tips to force them over that resistance. So we're talking about something really serious. We're talking about something that is extremely misogynistic. And I think we're talking about something collectively that we fail to recognize with the severity that it's due. Um, but that's plenty, plenty enough for me. I'm going to turn now to our panel, who all have expertise in different areas of how we tackle this, but also the positive side, because there's such positives to draw on as well in the way in which movement building is happening. So um, I think actually on that note, Naomi, can I come to you first and ask you to give us some of the positives? How can online tools be used to empower and support survivors? Um, yes, and thank you so much for the kind introduction um, and for that amazing provocation. Um, so, yeah, I work for an organisation called uh, CHEN, which is an, a wholly digital charity, so we exist only online, even pre-COVID. Um, and um, we've been around for about seven years, and how we uh, came to be is that our founder, Hiro Hussein, um, was supporting two friends in abusive um, relationships. One was in Pakistan and one was here in the UK, but was a Pakistani woman. And um, she was trying to find the sort of basic information that someone might need when they were in that sort of situation and exploring if and how to get out. Um, and realized it was actually really, really, really difficult just to find basic information about your rights, about what services were out there and so forth. And she um, was kind of uh, working in the tech for good space. She like knew about the power of the internet. She knew that it could be better. So she was like, okay, let's fix this. Um, and she basically started uh, collating information and resources for survivors. Um, initially, she was sort of looking just at Pakistan, but you know, one of the good and bad things about the internet is that things can spread very quickly. Um, and so very quickly, this um, idea um, picked up a lot of momentum. And before she knew it, she was sort of running a global volunteer network um, of people, predominantly survivors um, around the world, who were getting together, getting online, getting on big uh, Zoom sessions and Slack sessions to be like, let's find all the information that is out there and let's make it um, available to everyone in really accessible and kind and supportive ways. That was seven years ago, um, and, and a lot has happened since then. But essentially now what we do is build uh, wholly online uh, digital um, resources, but also interactive services that support survivors. Um, and I think that this is really, really important because we know that uh, one, in-person services um, in this country, but also around the world are really, really, really oversubscribed. There's long waiting lists. It can be really, really difficult to access support. Um, but th there's also a whole range of reasons why people might not be able to go to those sorts of services, from stigma to um, just not being ready yet, still being in an abusive relationship to, you know, thinking about young people thinking, oh, well, that's not for me. I, a lot of young people that experience abuse don't see themselves as domestic abuse or domestic violence victims because they don't live with that, that partner, they don't have children, they're not married and so forth. Um, and so what we do is try to replicate some of the sorts of support and sorts of services that you would get from some of those more traditional in-person 
groups um, and put that online and make it available to anyone. Um, and that is something that you know we couldn't do without the, without the power of the internet. Um, and, um, and, and also the fantastic thing about it is in terms of resources, it's pretty much like the, the, there's no limit to how much we can scale once something is online. Um, anyone you know can access it and we can we can grow in, in a really really um, big way as we have and support loads of survivors um, and yeah I'm, I'm happy to talk um, more in depth about some of the services if people have questions about that as well awesome thank you so much um, Sophia coming to you can you explain a little bit for people who don't necessarily know the kind of ins and outs of the tech side of it about how extremists are harnessing and exploiting online algorithms yeah, so I come at this from a really bizarre position in that I report on it, but I also feel like I'm a victim of it and, and subjected to it sometimes. Uh, and that has happened because of TikTok more so than any other social media platform I'm on, because I'm pretty much on all of them. Um, but with TikTok, it's really interesting. For example, if I make a video about any kind of random topic not at all connected to my identity as a woman or... Um, an interesting fact or research about gender equality, women's rights, uh, the body, um, because I cover a lot of sex education content now. And it's when I make a video on that, that I get the hate, that I get the abuse. Um, it will either restrict itself to TikTok comments or it may enter my DMs on other social media platforms that I am on. Um, and it will happen because the For You page, I don't know how many people here are on TikTok, but like, the For You page is the main content feed. And it will suggest content to you based on your previous viewing habits. So if you're the kind of person that regularly engages with content about feminism, um, and it, it's kind of irrelevant whether you're positively or negatively engaging with it, my videos will find them. They'll go to their For You pages. And it sometimes happens where I can tell in real time my video has hit them before it's hit um, the many women who will then later, as the video reaches them, say, oh yeah, thanks for saying this. Um, the good thing about TikTok comment culture is that um, there is a comment culture and there will be people who go into my comments, see the hate and call it out themselves. I don't feel like it's just me against, me against a sea of, of, of faceless, horrible people online. Um, other, other platforms don't necessarily have that vibe. They don't necessarily have this kind of positivity in comment sections. Um, and of course, it isn't always positive on TikTok. I want to give a really recent example. I made a video for, uh, the other day, you know, um, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Um, uh, I got nice comments on it. And then I have some people, one person literally wrote, we need more violence. Um, and I reported it, and I think it was less than 15 minutes later, the um, report notification comes back to me, this didn't violate any community guidelines. Um, that is because AI moderation doesn't understand nuance. Um, it would not have made the contextual understanding that, hang on, this is a video about violence against women. You're saying we need more violence. Uh-oh, they're saying we need more violence against women. They can't make that leap because they're, they're just you know, unsophisticated technology. Um, but I think following from that example, we also know about internet rabbit holes, and this obviously is not restricted to TikTok. This happens, is famously happened on YouTube. Um, every platform, and the next, you know, the next version of TikTok, whatever the next social media platform that comes that kind of takes over, um, is it a question that they will learn the mistakes of the platforms that came before them before they start happening on their platforms? Or do they just kind of happen anyway, but 10 times faster? And I have to say on TikTok, it's sadly the latter. Um, but something does have to be done about making these algorithms friendlier to female users who inevitably are gonna be subjected to online misogyny. Mm -hmm. um, and Julia, can you tell us a bit about how online tools can be used by perpetrators as part of a broader spectrum of abuse? Absolutely. So I think a useful term here is the idea of coercive control, which many of you might be familiar with. It's a term that's increasingly used instead of domestic violence to describe the way um, domestic violence isn't necessarily um, physical. It's not necessarily between people who are cohabitating, as Naomi was saying, 
but it's a pattern of coercive and controlling behavior, uh, of which sexual assault can be a part of. Um, also, once sexual assault has occurred, coercive control can be used to try to undermine a survivor's like, perception of their own reality, their own kind of ability to validate that what happened to them was abuse. Um, and unfortunately, kind of technology can be co-opted into patterns of coercive control into a variety of ways. Um, so it can be used to kind of constantly harass someone, uh, send them kind of me harassing messages. Um, it can be used for stalking, so monitoring someone online, um, and that can be as simple as social media stalking or location tracking. It can involve um, putting spyware on people's phones or forcing people to download spyware on their phones. Um, and generally creating kind of an environment of intimidation and control, uh, which takes away people's agency and seriously harms them. Um, and so obviously technology can be used for resistance, it can be used for building networks of support and for finding help, but unfortunately I think a lot of the features of technology that we see today are incredibly conducive to coercive control. The extent to which um, they collect information about us, how easy they make it to share that information and to monitor other people. Um, like, digital technology didn't have to be built that way. I think there's specific structural reasons for it. Um, like, I don't know if you've come across the idea of surveillance capitalism, um, as well as kind of even the origins of some of this technology in the military. Um, but we can build the technology differently and try to think about principles like consent um, that would counteract that. And I'm yeah, happy to talk about that more. But. Thank you, that's brilliant. Um, okay, so now a question for all the panel. We've covered some quite different ground there because I'm trying to give a kind of overview of the fact that this is obviously a very complex picture and you will come to it from quite different experiences and, and, um, and work. Um, can we talk a little bit at this point about the kind of global picture and about how the issue is intersectional, how it um, affects different communities in different ways and perhaps how the solutions need to navigate that as well? Naomi, let me come to you first. Yeah, sure. So I think it's, it's a really, really important point that like the intersections of technology and gender-based violence are already within any one particular region very, very complex as Laura said, but when you take it global and you look at how it shows up in different places, it's even more so. So the one thing is that in the UK, um, there has actually been um, some attention on, on this issue in recent years, um, and, but that's very, it's been quite focused on particular forms of um, tech abuse or tech facilitated gender-based violence, um, such as uh, image-based abuse, which is often called uh, revenge porn, um, uh, um, zoom bombing, uh, cyber flashing, and so forth. Um, and all of those are, are you know, exceptionally serious. Um, but when you take a global view, there's also many, many other ways that uh, tech abuse is being carried out, which um, from, a, from our standpoint, we might not immediately recognize as abuse or um, might just not be getting the time in the press. So to give some examples, um, there's an amazing organization in Pakistan called the Digital Rights Foundation, um, and they work on uh, on digital rights, as you'd imagine, and um, they have a cyber harassment uh, hotline, which is when people that are experiencing any sort of tech abuse can call them and they can get support, legal support, also therapeutic support and so forth. And um, many, many, many of their calls that they get are about uh, threats and blackmailing on the basis of images, so image-based abuse. But a lot of those images will not be what we would see as uh, intimate images. They won't necessarily be of a sexual nature. They won't necessarily be someone nude or semi-nude. But there'll be someone in a situation which, in their context, they wouldn't normally be out. They wouldn't be doing publicly. So potentially a woman with a man that she's not related to or married to. Potentially women in, in clothing, which is not what she'd normally wear in public. And that will, will be used to defame someone, to threaten someone, to blackmail someone, and so forth. Um, and, um, and so when we talk about you know, intimate images, we, we, we need to be yeah, really aware of how it shows up in different contexts. Even, and that would also affect you know, different communities in the UK. Equally, even when we talk about what is technology, I mean, here we're talking about sexual violence online, but in many parts of the world, technology is um, being used to abuse women even um, like more basic technology, so not necessarily social media, which is where the conversation sort of tends to focus, um, but for example, telecommunications. So 
uh, there's another fantastic organization in India called Point of View, um, and they work in a lot of rural communities in India. And a really common form of tech abuse there is um, what they call sort of wrong dials, which is essentially what we would probably know as like pranking someone, like when you're, when you're a kid and you prank call people, but incessant prank calling of people in, like, in quite small rural communities where you know that that person that is incessantly calling you and then just saying, oh, wrong number and hanging up is someone you're at school with or someone you work with. And actually, that's something that's going to make you feel really, really, really unsafe if you know somebody is targeting you in that way. Um, uh, maybe just to give one more example, um, I've spoken to women in Kenya um, who, where there's a big phenomenon of WhatsApp groups that men will make these big WhatsApp groups, which are essentially to share uh, sexual stories, which might be real, but often are imagined. And they will put loads and loads of their guy friends, colleagues, whatever, in these WhatsApp groups, and they'll just share stories about women that they know. And often these stories will be made up, and these stories will then go on to affect that woman's social relations, her career opportunities, and often she's not gonna know, because there's no women in these groups ever, right? So, so that's the first way that I think that it's, um, you know, sort of like intersectional, where we need to think of the ways that it shows up in, in different contexts. The second is that, what is available to you in terms of reporting processes and remedial measures is really, really, really different depending on where in the world you're based. And I don't mean that that is good in some places and bad in others. It's bad in all. Like, let's be completely honest. Like, if you are the most privileged woman in the UK and something happens to you, it's still not a good picture at all. Um, the reporting processes are still, you know, really difficult, often traumatizing. Um, you know, your, your options of support are, are very, very far from where they should be. But there is a massive difference in what is available to you if you are in a non-English speaking, if, if you don't speak English. Um, if you, um, especially if you speak a sort of local or regional language, a non-European language, um, sometimes reporting mechanisms simply do not exist. Um, and stuff like um, how, how quickly they'll be responded to and so forth, it will really, really, really vary because um, they just, they, they simply won't have won't have the staff in um, working in those different languages and working in those different contexts. Um, that's particularly between the English-speaking world and non-English-speaking uh, countries. It's partic particularly between the global north and the global south. But it's also even within regions. So, for example, in Africa or in Latin America, the big social media companies will have their priority markets. And in those priority markets, they'll have you know, an office with real people that maybe, if you're lucky, you can get through to. But there'll be many, many countries where they have absolutely no people on the ground and no people working on them. And thus, the, the opportunities that are available to you in terms of reporting and in terms of getting support are going to be even less so. The final thing I'll say, because I know I'm going on a little bit, is um, there's also a sort of um, global justice element to this, um, which is, you know, Sophia mentioned about um, AI moderation, and often when we're talking about solutions, one of the solutions that is highlighted, which is really, really important, is moving away from AI moderation to human moderation. Um, and that is absolutely something that is important that we should be advocating for. However, in practice, what often happens is when we have that human moderation, it's ghost workers working in the global south who are paid next to nothing, who have no support, are given absolutely no um, support for the sort of re-traumatization they go through, through moderating all of that content. Um, and, and those are the, and yeah, and that's what's kind of loud as, as a solution. So when we talk about human moderation and, and we advocate for that, we have to be very clear that that needs to be properly supported, properly resourced, and we need to acknowledge also the trauma uh, on those people doing, doing that work. Brilliant, thank you. Sophia, something? I've got two really good examples for this that I'll try and, try and race through. Um, one example is when we think about um, when the manosphere collides with different national contexts. And I'm really just at the very beginning of my research with this regard, um, because I'm beginning to explore what's happening in the Middle East, in which there is very much a growing red pill movement. Red pill is similar to what you were describing earlier about the, the slot machine, the second option, about you can game the system. Um, it's not sort of totally nihilistic. And um, in this context, um, there, there is a substantial, like, portion of people who um, politically will identify as very nationalist and that nationalism translates as very anti-West and they see feminism as an import from the West and so they'll target feminism and this happened recently in Kuwait. Kuwait um, in the last couple of years has had a real um, Me Too movement of its own 
really led by online activists. Um, so as a result, there are a lot of misogynists online who have adopted exactly the same tactic. Um, the hashtag for their Me Too movement went viral. So they started coming up with their own hashtags, one of them being um, literally calling for the tajrim of feminism, which is the criminalization of feminism, which got an awful lot of traction. So that's how, it, you know, in different parts of the world, in, again, other languages, just like you've described, they don't... Um, they often do not have the same size moderation teams as English language um, teams will for loads of platforms. And you can check that for yourself if you go through LinkedIn and you try and see um, how big teams are or who works for what team in different parts of the world or the jobs currently being advertised. I won't say which platform, but you can probably guess which. If you have a look, you'll really get a sense of where, where they're investing um, language-wise and where they're not investing in. A second example I want to raise um, which I have done an awful lot more research in, is how um, you'll find a lot of the, the lexicon of like, it will either be very clearly incel language or kind of incel adjacent language, um, alpha male, for example, which might not be, you know, that might not come from someone exposed to a lot of incel ideology, but it could be, or like adjacent ideology. Um, and it has, research has found so much of that content in online forums about sexual dysfunction. Um, the, one of the most famous ones would be NoFap, um, but the NoFap movement in which um, lots of people, men and women, um, decide that uh, they, they, they kind of get a quite an anti-porn mentality and they will stop masturbating. And they, they, there is a whole lifestyle content movement around all of this. Um, a lot of hateful language around women is found in forums like that. What we're lacking at the moment is really good research into incels, it's really nascent, but the, um, a literature review that's, um, I'm not sure it's even been properly published yet, I think it's about to be peer-reviewed, um, but the literature review found we don't have much research on incels, but guess who we do have research on? Older virgins. Um, and I, I really hate that terminology in my book, I really kind of have whole chapters based on how I really don't like the use of that word. I don't like the use of virginity, which is ultimately like not real. Um, it's a social construct. But the research that has gone into psychological profiles of young people who are made to feel shameful about what's going on in, in their sex lives, which is perfectly normal, um, and how easy it is to not sort of seek support for it offline. Um, we know that, for example, with sexual dysfunction, 75% of men will never like talk to anyone about it, never mind a GP. Um, so they go to Dr. Google, they go to the internet, they go to forums which promise solutions, and then they encounter this kind of language, and then the rabbit hole begins. And it's in these groups that you'll find really grim language that keeps on perpetuating myths about, hateful myths about women. One really good example, and this is a little bit graphic, I apologize, but it's really important, roasties. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever encountered that word. You'll find it a lot in forums of this nature. Roasty is to describe a woman who's had a lot of sex because it's the idea that she will be left looking like roast beef, um, which I hope I don't need to tell anyone in this room is complete poppycock, and that's not how the human body works. Um, but um, they go to these forums. There's, there's no one countering that narrative. So, of course, you're going to reinforce it. You're going to believe it. And you may end up calling a woman it online. Thank you. And Julia, if I can come to you, um, either perhaps on how these kind of intersections have shown up in your work, or also perhaps if we can start to talk a little bit about why it is that people find it so difficult to take this stuff seriously. Yeah, absolutely. I think just very quickly on the first question, I think when thinking about the global context and intersectionality, I think it's also important to keep in mind that almost all of the major companies that produce this technology are either in China or in the United States, and the culture that they embed, particularly for you know, the, the, the American companies, isn't just American culture, but a specific type of Silicon Valley culture, uh, which is then universalized across the world. And so those co the, the codes of conduct and the policies of those platforms will reflect very kind of specific, narrow American cultural ideas about, for example, what counts as an intimate image, um, or values like that technology or the market is a solution to things, um, that more kind of sharing is good, um, and, and fail to take into consideration like a, a variety of uh, 
different specific cultural factors and, and fail to take those different cultural contexts as seriously. Um, but in terms of why it can sometimes be difficult for people to take these problems seriously, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to just generally the, the, the problems that we as a society still have with um, responding appropriately to sexual violence and the kind of constant delegitimizing uh, or normalizing that we have with rape culture. Um, but specifically with technology, I think you'll hear from kind of, unfortunately from schools and or from law enforcement, uh, invalidating things like it's, it's less serious when it happens online, like if it's not, if it didn't happen to you physically, um, it's not, yeah, as, as real uh, when we know from research that the kind of like psychological damage that can come, a, come from psychological forms of abuse. And I think that is a good way to understand online sexual violence is that it often is a form of psychological abuse as well as sexual violence. Mm -hmm. um, that those harms are incredibly serious and, and, and difficult to recover from and kind of require lots of work from the survivor, from their community to, to help heal from and then continue to kind of keep yourself safe from. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, I know this is a difficult question, but what would you like to see change? Um, what, what would positive action look like to try and overcome some of these issues? Um, yeah, so I think there's so much that can change. And I think the first thing to say is like, when we're talking about these big tech platforms, they are literally the biggest, richest, most powerful organizations in the whole world. So like the idea that they can't get a grip of this problem is just ridiculous. And we need to be very clear when we're um, you know, communicating them with them and calling for solutions um, and calling for them to take action that that is the power dynamic. Like they literally could not have any more power on the world than they do. Um, but um, I think that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things, and I think that as with anything, there's like the more systemic solutions, and then there is, um, uh, you know, the sort of what you might call low hanging fruit, but actually, which can, in this case, can still be super, super, super impactful. So, you know, at the systemic level, one of the key problems here is that the way that uh, social media platforms have been designed and their business model in a lot of ways is, um, completely counterproductive to talking about tackling tech abuse. Like generally te tech platforms, their business models are based on engagement and abuse, unfortunately, in the world that we live in is, um, is good for engagement. And until they separate those two things and say actually some things are more important than that and we're gonna prioritize women and marginalized genders and other marginalized people's safety, um, there's only so far that will go. Um, and also, you know, to speak to those issues that we mentioned earlier of um, regional inequalities and the prioritization of different markets, also saying we're not only going to prioritize that in our, in our um, um, priority markets, but actually like for every woman and every marginalized person um, in the world. Um, there is also, though, some really, really sort of practical things that uh, could and should be done very um, well, maybe not very easily, but I think very easily given the resources that they have. Um, so one, I think, basic but super impactful thing would be more customization um, for in all tech platforms in terms of people's privacy settings, but also in terms of what you see. So each of us on any platform that we use, we should really be able to tailor what we want to be public and what we don't want to be public and what we want to see and what we don't want to see. And different platforms have this to different elements, to, to, to different degrees, um, but there's no platforms actually where that is like completely customizable. So I think that would be one very, very, um, uh, like, yeah, that would be a really, really good first step. Um, and then the second is reporting processes for when abuse does happen. Um, one, they're really, really complex. There's a lot of jargon that is used. Um, you know, that would be very, very easy to fix. Also being completely transparent about what the process is, mm -hmm. who, um, who is involved in that process, how long it's gonna take. And actually in that regard, if it's gonna take a while, it's better that you're upfront and you say that rather than saying, oh, we're gonna get back to you in seven days and then you don't. And that's something that's super traumatizing for the survivor as well. Um, and then again there, I think being flexible um, in the way that um, those processes work um, can have a really big impact. So one, don't force people that have been through something like this 
to um, kind of categorize their trauma or their experience in terms of a few really, really rigid categories, like create that form and create that process in a way where people can use their own words um, and that they can report experiences that might fall outside of the most sort of commonly spoken forms of tech abuse. That's one thing. To create uh, systems where people can appoint somebody else to do that process on their behalf. Mm -hmm. So if I've been through that, I might not want to do it, but my best friend who supported me through that whole process knows as much as I do, and she might be able to do that for me in a way which is less traumatizing. Um, I think that's really important. And then thirdly, you know, there is so many um, amazing civil society organizations out there, uh, campaigning groups out there, support groups out there all over the world who are working on this issue. And so tech companies should be speaking to them as they as they create these solutions, working with them, also resourcing them for their time, um, but making sure that when someone does come and report a um, report something that they've been through, um, they're also, um, you know, they, there's pathways to connect them with those services um, and to support them beyond the reporting process. Absolutely. And here in the UK, actually, Glitch is a really great charity if anybody is experiencing or wants support around online abuse. And the Centre for Countering Digital Hate is doing really fantastic research in this area. If anyone wants to be looking at this and learning more about it, that's another great place to go. Um, in a minute, we will come on to some questions from the audience, but I want to hear from our final two panellists on this particular... I think you answered that so well. I don't know how much more I have to add. Um, I wish... So... Journalists, we all have to do a better job at holding power to account on all of this. And it isn't always only tech platforms. It is governments. Um, it's about holding all of the structures that hold power to account and c drawing the lines between the two. Sometimes it's not actually clear how, oh, actually, you could be doing something to help us deal with this other problem. But now we've got two problems because neither of you are doing anything. So I think that's one thing. And something else, I just wish that... Um, I, I really grew up in the age of social media. So for my, I'm 27. It began with Facebook, and then you know all the other ones came along. And now my, I have a rich diet of social media platforms that I log on, log into every day. Um, I cannot say or tell you that I've ever been given any proper training in online resilience until these power systems sort themselves out and protect us. Um, in an internet that was not made with women in mind, um, I have to look after myself. I have to look after the people around me. I have to look after my, my female colleagues who get really badly harassed. And it's um, my colleagues who are women of color who get far more harassed than me. Um, I feel like I have to simultaneously be a support network. And I also have to try and build my own support network and figure out resilience. Um, it's actually only lately, the first time in my whole career, um, in which I've always worked in social media. I've always worked in digital as soon as I left uni, is what I was working in. It was the first time in my career that someone gave me really sensible contingency plans for if this were ever to happen online to you. It accepted the reality that I, I'm on social, I'm a visible face. Um, if I got doxxed, what do I do? Uh, if you got sent, if you were simply bombarded with, with content of a certain nature, what do you do? Um, and I now have a plan. And I can't believe it's been four and a half years, nearly five into this career, and that's the first time someone has said it to me, because in the meantime, I'd been building my own. I'd been working out for myself. D and in most cases, um, dealing with it alone. Um, and I still don't think I have weighed the psychological impact that that has made on me. And I think it will, it will conti continue bearing it, you know, years to come. Thank you. And Julia? Yeah, so I first I'd like to absolutely second everything Naomi and, um, sorry, Sophia just said about um, company platforms and kind of giving people tools for resilience um, and protecting themselves. I think I'd like to add a bit on sort of building consent culture online. Um, so I think it's a really tricky thing with digital security advice because it's, it's an area that I work in um, because I think too often uh, people's responses to online abuse of women are telling women how to keep themselves safe online, which is both incredibly important but does create a lot of extra work for people to be having to think about this all the time. And it can also, I think in its worst form, permit, like transform into a form of victim blaming, like why are you on these platforms, why are you sharing this online? 
uh, why haven't you like got good cybersecurity practices? Um, and so I think shifting the burden onto thinking about how to respect um, consent online, so including, I mean, I think obviously we aren't even at that stage yet, but I think consent education should be absolutely universal in schools, but I think internet practices need to be a part of that consent education, but rather than, you know, teaching people to not share images of themselves or like how to, um, you know, use privacy settings, it should be about like, teaching people from a really early age why you shouldn't share uh, an incriminating picture, and that doesn't have to be a sexual picture, but like why you shouldn't share pictures of your friends without their consent, um, or how to like both set and respect people's boundaries, how to recognize if somebody is infringing on your boundaries. Um, because unfortunately, I think with online spaces, surveillance is so normalized. So I think there's statistics that like over 70% of people think it's acceptable to ch check their partner's phone if they suspect infidelity. Um, and I think we need to be much more proactively kind of building values of consent and how we interact with each other online that often kind of go against the way the, the systems are built. Thank you. And I think um, for anybody who's listening today, very often in an audience like this, there might be people who are thinking about starting their own campaigns or perhaps already have. And quite often, I think people feel that this is a panel like this might be off-putting, and I don't think that's any of our intention. Um, I think that I would agree, and we would all agree, that this is not about you having to protect yourself, having to feel that you're responsible for avoiding online abuse, but there are some really great toolkits out there if you are thinking about doing something that might increase your visibility and you're worried about the impact of online abuse. There are some really, really good uh, materials available um, from the Women's Media Center Speech Project in particular. Um, from Jacqueline Friedman um, in the US has really good resources specifically around this um, and also from Glitch who provide uh, online resilience training as well. So on that note, let's open up and hear from you. Um, do we have a microphone or are we just, yeah, there's a microphone which will come to you. So please, can you wave if you'd like to ask a question over here to begin with? Hi. That was louder than I expected it to be. Hi, uh, my name is Sophie Wilkinson. I work as a senior researcher at the Centre for Countering Digital Hate. Thank you for the, uh, for the shout out there. And uh, it's great to hear from all of you. Uh, when Laura asked what could be changed, not one of you mentioned our government's upcoming online safety bill. Do we have any hope that it's going to do anything? And if it's going to do something, you know, it, it, is there anything that you think should be in there? Or is there no hope it's going to do anything? Wh what do we reckon? Like Nadine Dorries has said all sorts of different things. Some of them... I would say align very closely to what we're doing at the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, but some of them maybe not so um, uh, aligned, but I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to whether this bill's gonna do anything, because the world is watching apparently. Thank you, great question. Does anybody want to jump in there? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can have a go. So I think, um, yeah, I think the online safety bill is both incredibly interesting and very complicated, and I, I think I'm still working through exactly how I feel about it. I think there's some things that I really like and I'm really excited about it. I think on a kind of, uh, I guess, governance level, the fact that it states that companies have a responsibility to be doing things about online harms, like to, to, to be keeping people safe on their platforms is incredibly important, and I think a good, like, it goes in a different direction to what most of internet regulation is, which is based on uh, Section 230 in the US, which has always created this environment where platforms aren't responsible for what people publish online, um, which is good for freedom of speech, but has also created a situation where like, companies can and do profit off of really harmful material. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think we see that in a lot of, uh, a lot of different areas. Um, I think there's concerns kind of from all sides about the online safety bill, about the way that it's drafted, mm -hmm. that it's quite vague in some ways, that it's, it's difficult to define what an online harm is. And so um, the definitions are, I think, s still being debated. And so for example, the online harms, uh, the online safety bill doesn't explicitly include a woman or violence against women um, as, a, as a significant priority for harms. And I think that's a, that's a serious problem with the bill. Um, and I think there's also a lot of concerns from digital privacy advocates that the bill could um, end up being a kind of backdoor to, to platforms like being censoring much more speech uh, than is good. 
because uh, they'll be kind of left to interpret fairly vague guidelines. And if they're risk averse, that it might be much harder to speak out on like subjects that are difficult but important. Um, kind of like you were describing with algorithms already being quite blunt in the way that they decide what to take down and what to leave up. Um, that might be escalated by this bill. Um, I think a part of me is, I guess overall probably would want to see it pass to see how it would work. I think we need more kind of like more thinking and more experimentation with how we regulate platforms because they've been allowed to like amass enormous amounts of money through a lack of regulation. Um, but it is really tricky and probably requires more thought going forward. But do you have any other comments? I would add that um, I agree with you about how I still don't think it's going to understand nuance online any better than, than tech platforms already do. The other thing I would add is that um, I did an investigation lately in which I found that barely any teachers in England have accessed um, training to deliver relationships and sex education. And within that curriculum, it's the first time it's been updated in 20 years, and this is specifically um, these are sort of optional modules online that the government keeps directing teachers to, just to caveat that. Teachers may have been able, if they're lucky enough, budgets to get resources elsewhere. But those modules include internet safety and harms and online and the media, um, which includes some training regarding social media versus reality. Uh, if you encounter pornographic content online, how to not let it you know, negatively affect your sex life, stuff like that. Um, if we don't have teachers training kids about that kind of stuff, what's the point of an online harm bill? Um, it, that's not the only place. We already have the, the 2017 amendment to law that brought that new curriculum in. Um, we need to check on the other laws going as well. Thank you. Amy, do you want to come in? Are you happy for me to take another question? Okay, another question, please. Over there, we have one. Hi, um, I volunteer with an organization called Beyond Equality, and uh, they do workshops in schools with boys on mental health, violence, homophobia, etc. and a lot of stuff that comes up is with relation to social media. So addressing sort of the point that you've just made, um, obviously there's, you know, you can have as many charities or organizations or grassroots movements as you like trying to support young people and teachers who may not have accessed this content, but what do you think is the balance of, of power, like how can we bring corporations and governments in line along with, you know, charities and grassroots movements that are addressing these issues and what's the appropriate balance of sort of that work to address online hate and, and violence? I don't know if that made sense. This is, I'll try to be really quick with this, but um, it was really interesting when I had this data set showing me how low the download numbers were for the varying modules in uh, relationships and sex ed, there was one outlier at 29,000 views, whereas all the other ones had been between 866 and I think around 5,000 downloads. Bear in mind there are over 20,000 uh, state primary and secondary schools in the country. Um, and when you realize that government did a pretty good job of directing teachers to that mental well-being resource to train them up, and there was on top of that was back in 2020 and on top of that in 2021 i believe they announced an additional 70 million pounds of ring fence funding into uh, mental well-being training in schools if you look at the amount of funding that has been given for the rollout of relationships and sex education training it's not anywhere near 17 million um, they said it was going to be 6 million an expert i spoke to last week said she thinks she read it was 4.2 somewhere. Uh, perhaps not all the six million has been rolled out yet. Will it all be rolled out? Um, when they want to get their act together and really support people, they really do. Um, they often do find the money. Um, and it's every single educator and expert I spoke to for that story said, all we need is funding to then get the access to the high quality training. And then we will be able to give ourselves the training that we need. Um, yeah, so on the question of, of the balance between the two, I mean, as with everything, like we need both. Um, it's a very complex and systemic problem, and so we need multiple different interventions at different parts of the system. Um, I would say that 
the best way to sort of understand it is that tech violence or violence perpetrated through technology is an extension of all other forms of gender-based violence. And we know that the root causes for that and tackling the root causes for that are um, you know, not only on the policy side um, in terms of um, uh, like responses to, but also education and awareness and all of that kind of stuff. So the sort of work that Beyond Equality and other groups do is obviously absolutely vital. And when we're talking about um, training on gender-based violence and sexual violence, I think technology just has to be part of all of that now, and it can't be a separate thing, and it can't be a separate module, especially with young people, because um, we know particularly um, image-based abuse is so, 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 so rife um, among young people and is affecting so many young girls in this country. Um, but at the same time, you know, governments and technology companies do have the power. Um, and so I think, you know, ultimately um, a lot of the accountability and responsibility lies um, with the tech companies and the governments to, to regulate them. Um, so we have to do both. <laughs> we think we've got time for another question. Is there any other questions? One here in the middle. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy, and I run Fumble, which is a sex ed charity for young people. We're online, creating a happy, healthy online world of relationships and sex education. And we co-create everything we do, there's a group of us on this row here, with young people um, to make sure their voice is at the heart of all of it, because we recognize that young people are the earliest adopters of new technology. And that's a real challenge, like, even though we're doing that work, working with young people, I think that's a challenge for us as a society. Like, how do we keep responding to the things that young people particularly are struggling with when they're the earliest adopters and they're forging these new types of interactions? They're the first ones on the new channels, sort of out there by themselves. How do we support them with that sort of digital citizenship stuff when they're the sort of leading, they're the vanguard of it? That's a great question. Julia? Was it how do we support young people? Yeah, specifically when they're the kind of pioneers in yeah. any particular area. Yeah, so I think this is maybe a slight um, detour, but when I was visiting my family in Poland most recently, I had such an interesting kind of kitchen table conversation with my older brother, who's like 15 years older, and his uh, daughter, so my niece, um, about how... At, every, at each of our generations, when we were in children in school, we were using technology in different ways that our like, teachers couldn't understand. So for him, that was like, I guess what would have conventionally been called hacking in the 90s. Like, for me, it would have been setting up Facebook groups or like putting things on Facebook that teachers weren't aware of. Um, but for my niece, uh, who's spent like eight of the past 12 months on Microsoft Teams, doing all of her schoolwork in Microsoft Teams, it was all of the different ways that children were finding ways to like subvert or do things with teams that, that teachers were finding it difficult to keep track of. Um, and I think it's, it's so often that I think the first instinct that parents have is towards using technology as a means of control. So for example, setting up um, monitoring devices onto children, like onto children's, well monitoring software onto children's devices or restricting certain websites so that children can't access them. And I think neither our technology nor adult awareness of technology is ever going to keep up to how kids are innovating online, uh, like exactly like you said. So I think the only route is to keep like open communication channels open with children so that they feel comfortable sharing if they see something disturbing, if something is making them feel bad, uh, or if someone is like hurting them online and they're not, they don't feel ashamed to share that. Because I think those basic dynamics of how important communication will be, that, that doesn't change regardless of what the platform is. But like, our ability to technically control what children are doing is always going to be outpaced by, by innovations in technology. Um, and I think also as a secondary point, the surveillance of children online, I think, really normalizes a lot of more harmful forms of surveillance. So spyware, um, so covert apps which track um, you know, which websites you go to, sometimes like who you're messaging, what you're messaging. In a lot of countries, including the UK, aren't illegal. And the reason that they're not illegal is because they are able to be used on children without their knowledge or um, by employers on employees but the consent, with consent. But that consent can be like 
hidden into a contract, obviously there's loads of power dynamics where employees sign up to surveillance. And so something that in my view should be just straight up illegal, like covert surveillance should never be legal. I don't understand what kind of parenting situation would require you to be covertly surveilling your child and not even telling them that. Um, so I think, yeah, that was <laughs> maybe a bit of a detour, but I think fundamentally it's about continuing to like communicate with children and create a, a situation of safety and honesty where they can come forward and share these things and you can keep talking with them about it and, and learning about what they're doing from them rather than from like a stalking app. Thank you so much. I know we could go on all day, but unfortunately we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, all of you for coming. Thank you to this incredible panel.